This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Hello, world, and welcome to a Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta. Today's sponsor is A2 Hosting. I've been using A2 Hosting solid state hosting solutions for our website at geekleader.com for many, many years now and absolutely love their support, their service, and all the features that you get. You get access to cPanel. You get all of the things that you can imagine for a great WordPress experience, including their A2 optimized WordPress, which does extra security checks, extra lockdown. It, you can lock down your editor uh, file so you can't edit anything inside there. You get alerts whenever there are file changes that are done. Um, you can also do automatic updates, backups, and more with A2 hosting. So highly recommend it. Go to a geekleader.com slash A2 to get more information and to sign up for their solid state turbocharged speed hosting today. Again, that's a geekleader.com slash A2. All right, geek leaders. Today on the show, I am honored to have Jim Wetrich. He is the CEO of the Wetrich Group of Companies, and he's the author of a book called Stifle, Where Good Leaders Go Wrong. He also wrote a book called Quietless, and we're going to be talking about how um, leaders can uh, try to avoid some of the areas where we, we tend to tend to make mistakes and tend to uh, mess up on. And hopefully, uh, Jim will help us with that today. Anyway, with all that being said, Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. It's a delight to be here and, and a pleasure and, and look forward to uh, working with you today. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. If you don't mind, just tell the audience a little bit about how you got to where you are in your career and what is it that you do over at the What Group of Companies? Yeah, John, thanks. Um, mostly I'm focusing on um, mentoring and uh, executive coaching. I have been, uh, and we'd still do uh, consulting. We help medical device companies get their products into the U.S. hospital marketplace. That's really our sweet spot. Um, but personally, I've been, as I mentioned, doing a lot of coaching and, and mentoring. I've been working since 1981, so over 40 years um, exclusively in the healthcare space. And um, I've been very fortunate to have worked for some great people and some great leaders and some great companies. And I can tell you, as I tell a lot of my clients, I would have never been able to do what I have done without having mentors in my life. Mm. So, yeah, so I, I'll tell you what, just from my firsthand account, mentors have really helped me. Uh, I remember when I first became a manager and uh, I didn't have any formal leadership or even management training beforehand. It was kind of like one of those roles where like, oh, you're pretty good at what you do. You're a good coder. Let's make you a manager of coders. You know? Sure. <laughs> and, sure. Uh, and I sucked at it pretty, pretty bad. And <laughs> we, we did this uh, leadership training that they made us all do about six months after becoming a manager, which they should have done it beforehand, in my opinion. But uh, the, all the executives of the company kind of came out and talked about, oh, if you're interested in mentorship, and it sounded like they were reading from a script. So I, I, I'd heard um, uh, from other, like I, at the time I was trying, trying to learn more about leadership. So I was watching TED Talks. And this is kind of before podcasts really became uh, a thing, a way to, for people to learn. Um, so I was trying to figure out how I can become a better leader. And a lot of people said, hey, you need a mentor, you need a mentor. So I emailed every single one of these EVPs that asked me about, about uh, becoming having mentors and only one of them accepted and said that they would take me in as a, as a mentee. The other ones were like, well, I'm going to retire soon, or I'm not really interested. This is something HR was making us do. <laughs> um, but this mentor that took me in, he, he helped so much with helping me realize and see the things that were right in front of me that I didn't even know were there. And uh, sometimes that brutal truth is really necessary. Absolutely. And, and your, your journey is very, very, very typical, by the way. And uh, even today, in spite of all the evidence and all the data, we have a lot of individual contributors that get put into management roles and they have a two day management you know, training program. They tick the box, put it in the HR file and, and off you go. And uh, it's, it's in part why a number of people are not doing well, because they're just not really being well coached, well-trained and well-mentored. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And, you know, is, is that one of the main areas where leaders go wrong or, or what, what, is, what is the book stifled really focusing on where it comes to where people, where, where leaders make their mistakes? Yeah. Uh, great, John. I, there's a lot of different areas, but um, one of them really is uh, as you're, uh, as you know, you experience being put into these roles 
And what we're not doing is we're not developing and continuing to train and work with and coach these, these people in these new roles. It's very challenging, as I'm sure you may have found out. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's a lot of opportunities to, to make uh, big mistakes. And, um, you know, we, we just aren't doing an adequate job of onboarding these people in these roles and providing, you know, input, supervision, uh, advice, counsel. Um, I I'm personally believe that <clears throat> what happens is people don't know how to manage. And so they tend to overmanage or micromanage or get too much into the details or they were familiar with the job before. So I do what my strength is and I get more into my individual contributor role as opposed to my managing role. And what people really want is to be led and given the opportunity to do the work the way they want to do it. And it's a hard lesson to learn as a new manager, let people do the work the way they want to do it within you know boundaries and reason. And what I found actually, John, when you let go as a manager, what I found in my career is people actually did the work better than I would have done it. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, you just got to give them some degrees of latitude and figure out which people can have more degrees of latitude and which people need a little bit more, you know, uh, attention. Yeah. I had that exact same experience. Uh, And that was going back to the whole mentor thing. Um, I I had people quitting and and just didn't have a very good grasp on things. And I remember my mentor was talking to me one time and he said, you know, you don't scale. He's like, one thing that leaders need to do is to scale their team, scale the work that they do. And if everything has to funnel through you, you, you know, it's not going to scale. You, yep. you have, you know, at the time, I think I had six developers on the team and it was my first management job. He's like, you know, you're, you're getting six people's work all going through one person. So you're limiting yep. that bandwidth. You need to let yep. go. And yep. it was so hard to do. But once I did it, then it was like, oh, OK, now I see what's going on. Now I'm more of like the. uh I'm more like the conductor orchestrating things instead of, you know, the person has to play every instrument. Well, well said. Yeah. Really great analogy. And so true. And, and uh, it it is, it is hard to let go, particularly when, you know, people are holding you accountable for results that your team is, is, uh, you know, has signed up for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, that was one of the, the hardest things for me was to, uh, to, to recognize that these developers, you know, maybe it was ego. I don't know. Um, c- could do the work as good, if not better than I could do it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It is. It is. And I, I can tell you, I, I, there's no doubt. Um, there's no doubt because that's the benefit of having people working with you. They've got different backgrounds, different training, different perspectives, different ways of doing things. And, um, you know, particularly with the younger generation, um, I tell people, you know, because a lot of senior people have a lot of trouble managing millennials. And I, I say, you know, water them and get the heck out of the way, right? They know how to do things. They're very productive. They're very bright. They're very creative. They know how to use the technology better than any of us of my generation. So, you know, let them, let them flourish, let them, let them grow. And um, I think there's just huge opportunity there. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. But it's, you know, how is it that we can get out of our own way? And how, how, would you have any advice for people that, that struggle with that ego getting in the way and they, they feel like they have to be involved in every piece and can't just let their, their team, you know, flourish, I, like you're saying? Yeah, I think it's a maturation process. And, and again, I think, um, you know, people from, from outside can help, whether it's an advisor, a confidant, a mentor, a coach, whatever. I mean, uh, even Jeff Immelt, who was the chairman and CEO of GE up until recently, who wrote a book about his experience uh, at GE called Hot Seat, um, you know, he, he um, noticed that he failed because he thought he had have, have all the answers, right? And you just, there's so much, um, there's so much technology and so, so much expertise now required in every job as a general manager or as a CEO or a president, you can't have all the answers. You just can't. It's, it's the business and technology is too complicated. So you've just got to let go and um, focus. I think uh, John on developing your people, what can I do to help you develop? What gaps do you have? Where do you want to go in your career? Um, and sometimes you just need people outside to 
to you know ask the questions to make sure you're not trying to do too much um, and demotivating your team. Yeah. So going back to that, you know, I want to hit on that demotivating your team because I know when I first realized that I couldn't scale and I had to take a step back, I took the the approach that I'm going to focus more on like seeing where the the gaps are, where are the weak areas. And then I got in the habit of, and maybe you know where I'm going with this, I pointed those out probably too much. Mm -hmm, (laughs) And and it really demotivated the team because it seemed like all that their boss was doing was telling them everything that was wrong. Yeah. How can I balance that? Yeah, well, I I think particularly it's a great question. Um, And I think particularly right now, John, um, with with all the angst and all the pressure and all the stuff going on, you know, literally as we speak, still we're struggling with getting out of the pandemic. We're all trying to figure out how to get back to work. Is it going to be virtual, hybrid, whatever it is? There's now, you know, added pressures with um, you know, the, the, the war in the Ukraine, there's now uh, the stock markets tanking, right? And it's just, uh, it, you know, an un- unfortunate, you know, storm of all these activities. So part of what I try to counsel people and coach people is make sure your interactions with your team members aren't always transactional, right? If if you, if I'm working for you and, and you only just ask me about work, 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 right? I, you know, it's the old line from John Maxwell that I love. Um, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So having some actual, you know, non-transactional conversations. Hey, Jim, this is John. Just calling up. Don't want to talk about business. Give me five minutes. How are you doing? You know. How are you doing, right? How are things going? And and being intentional about that. And then also, you know, one of the things we just don't do enough is celebrate our successes and celebrate our wins and give that positive feedback, right? Because things are so pressurized. Timelines are so short. We've got to get the program written. We've got to get the coding done. We've got to get the product out the door. We've got to deliver. And I... I've never seen any data, John, and I wouldn't even know how to quantify this, but I can tell you, I believe that people today are working twice as hard as we did 20 years ago. And it wasn't like we were slackers and sloughing off. It's just, that's the nature and pace of work, right? Mm -hmm. And so making sure we stop and celebrate and praise people and, and uh, give them, give them that recognition. Recognition now is, is more important than I think it's ever been. So, you know, I, I don't disagree with you at all. I feel like the pace of work has, um, even in my you know 20 year career has escalated you know, incredibly, you know, a huge amount. Um, and, uh, you know, it was when I first started, you left work at, you know, five o'clock and you didn't think about work. You weren't notified by work. You didn't hear anything unless something went horribly wrong. Right. Now I'm getting emails, you know, constantly you're getting notifications. You're getting people that, that feel like they have to be on all the time. And, you know, as as a leader, I think that it's important to set those good boundaries for your team so that you don't burn out everybody. You, you can, you know, re institute that work life balance and understand that, yeah, we, we do a lot of people do work at home now, but how do we get away from work and focus on home and how do we get back to work and focus on work? You know, how do you, how do you separate that out when we're the same person in both places? Yeah, it, it is. It is really hard. And, um, you know, all the all the wonderful, um, you know, technologies and equipment we have now make it, you know, so easy to connect. But I do think people have mm-hmm. to be intentional about it. Yeah. They've got to, you know, I, I know some CEOs, um, you know, of big companies that that don't have their email on on their phone. Right. Um, they, it, because it's just too easy. It's on my computer. It may be on my iPad, but if I have it on my phone and stuff keeps coming in 24 seven, I, I can't, I can't get focused. And I, I read quite a bit, John, about some companies that are really trying to work on how do we separate the work day? Um, we make times, maybe Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays, a collaborative time where people can get on teams, get on zoom, get on whatever, And then Tuesdays and Thursdays are individual time, time when we're not going to do Zoom calls and people can, you know, get their work done. Right. So I think we're still sorting some of that stuff out. I do believe 
we're we're over communicating, right? Um, you know, I I find a lot of my coaching clients I talk to spend an inordinate amount of their time every day trying to find where to go. Do I go to Slack? Do I go to Teams? Do I go to Outlook? Do I go to my text messages? I mean, where do I go? Is is there stuff on SharePoint? And I think we've we've got in many cases in some companies too much. Um, uh, too many vehicles for communication. And I do think the manager has to set the, the expectation, right? If, if you're sending me messages at eight o'clock at night and, you know, 10 o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night, and I'm getting them, my normal reaction is going to be, well, my boss is messaging me. I should respond, right? We can delay through technology when those messages go out. I can type my messages all evening long but then, you know, defer them to go out at eight o'clock and nine o'clock the next morning. So we have to be careful about the expectation we set. And if I, and you know, if I'm working for you and you're sending me messages all day, Saturday and Sunday, because that's how you like to work. Unless we have an intentional conversation like, Hey, Jim, I don't want you to respond. It, you know, responding Monday morning's okay. It, we just have to be a little bit more um, clear about the expectations. Yeah. I think setting those expectations is important. And, um, I'll go back to, um, again, when I first became a manager in that, that those few years, um, I was working way too many hours and, you know, I, I felt like if I wanted to do a good job, I had to respond all the time. I had to always be on. If I got an email from anybody, I had to respond right away. My mentor told me, you know, and a shout out to Greg. He was, he was an awesome uh, mentor, um, but he, he told me that I needed to, to set some of those boundaries and those expectations and have that conversation with my boss about where this is going to be. And I said, well, well, you know, what, what if he fires me for that? He's like, he won't trust me. If you set those boundaries, you set those expectations, they're going to understand. And, you know, so I went and had that conversation. It was right after my second kid was born. And I said, look, uh, you know, I'm going to sign out of everything at six o'clock. I'm not going to work any past six until my kids yep. go to bed. And then after that, yep. I'll jump online. I'll check things. And he's like, oh, absolutely. I didn't, I never expected you to do that. I was like, yeah. what? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah. You know, Cause we didn't communicate that. Right. Right, right. So it's just it's just having the conversation. And I think that's absolutely fabulous. And some people are hesitant or reluctant or unwilling to have the conversation because they're not sure how their boss will react. Right. You know, yeah. so but but it's a it's a it's a general um, I, I, I think you know, one of the more most important issues right now, uh, John uh, and Google's found this through research they've done. You know, it's the whole notion of psychological safety, right? Mm -hmm. I have to be able to speak up at work. I have to be able to, you know, not fear retribution if I express my opinion. And I have to be able to have dialogue with my boss. And Google's found that the number one thing to team success in their organization is their practice of psychological safety. And of course, you know, what works at Google may not work at your company, but still being able to speak up and not you know, and, and not fear retribution because of something I said is really important and being able to have those dialogues like you had with your boss. Um, and it's just, it's just really critical. Really yeah. Critical. And I think it's important for, um, leaders to start those dialogues. Don't wait. There's for, no you doubt. Know, yeah. So I, I, my boss, you know, I was an excellent boss, you know, he didn't realize that he needed to, you know, that I was feeling that way. And I think that's yep. one of the things that I try to do with my team is tell them like, I don't expect you, if I send you an email at six o'clock, I don't expect you to reply. Yep, <laughs> I really yep, don't. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep, I said, yep. if I really need you, I'll call you. <laughs> I'm not gonna... That's right. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. And I, my last full-time job I had, that was the expectation I set with my staff. Look, if you really need something, call me, call me. You've got my cell phone number. I've always got it with me, right? I may not respond to your email. I may get buried in email. I may have too much email. It may take me too long, but if you really need something, call me, call me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and vice yeah. versa. Like, you know, Absolutely. Just, just because I'm working late doesn't mean that you need to work late. <laughs> That's exactly yeah. right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So um, one of the things that I think you've talked about um, on other, other shows and things is about self-awareness. How uh -huh. can, um, you, what is the trap that people fall into about not being self-aware as a leader? Well, I think it's, uh, I'm glad you brought it up. I think it's one of the most important things and, and aspects and, and, you know, there's a number of different uh, tools and processes and approaches. And, and also as a manager, you can at some point 
you know, conduct a 360 review process and have your manager and the people you're working with and people you're uh, managing, you know, fill in surveys and things and give you feedback. You know, it, the nice thing about a 360, if a cohort's large enough, you can get a bunch of anonymous feedback from people, both quantitative and qualitative, which can be really helpful. But um, just looking, you know, it, it's the old Michael uh, Jackson song, right? It all starts with the man in the mirror, right? Yeah. Just being self-critical and, and realizing that we all have to grow. And then every opportunity at every step in our lives and in every step of our careers, uh, we have to continue to grow and continue to learn. And, you know, I'm 65 years old. I'm still making mistakes. I'm <laughs> still learning. I'm still growing. And I suspect I will till, till the end. So it's just important to realize, particularly now, John, I think when so much has changed, it's really fascinating to me to see how some executives are responding and some companies are responding to this return to work situation, right? We're mandating you have to go back to the office. We're mandating you have to go back to the office Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We're mandating you have to go out back to the office one day a week, right? And there's all kinds of tugging and things going on. And I think some executives have learned a tremendous amount during the last two years or so of the pandemic. And it's really changed the way they're approaching uh, work, right? We've seen virtually almost every company of all shapes and sizes pivot, right? Whether it was Ford that, you know, a week later was making, you know, face masks and things like that to companies that started making ventilators that didn't know anything about ventilators. I mean, there's, there's just tens of thousands of stories there. So what are the learnings that we've had in business over the last two years? And what are you doing as a senior executive to, to look into some of the insights, right? Mm -hmm. Some people have defaulted to just going back to what we've always done. This is the way we've done it. We've always been in offices and this is the way we're going to continue to do it because that's what I'm comfortable with. And I think the really powerful and most likely senior executives that are going to succeed are people that have really taken a, a tremendous amount of learning from what we've experienced the last two and a half years. And part of that is self-awareness. Yeah. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the remote work environment because we talked about, you know, getting to know your team and, you know, under, you know, showing them that you care. And, and for me, that was a challenging thing when we were um, fully remote in the fact that, it was hard. You know, there were some people maybe that didn't report to me that were in the same business that I don't have any active projects on that I just never talked to. And I yep. lost those communication boundaries because I yep. felt like if I sent them a message and just said, Hey, how are you doing? I, yep. It's kind of creepy. It's, yep. you know, I'm, yep. I'm bothering yep. them because maybe they're doing yep. something. And yep. I, how do you, how do you get, get through that? Well, I think there's a couple of things. One, you know, I think you can just call, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and as opposed to a message. And I think the other thing, and I know uh, I've done this in my career for other reasons, but I've also suggested it to a number of my coaching clients over the last two years during the pandemic. If you got it, and not everybody's got it for all kinds of reasons, but if you've got it, you know, um, I encourage people to send people a written note. I mean, mm -hmm. an old style, get some note cards, you know, and uh, just if you've got the employee's home address and you've got access to it, just send them a note saying, you know, Jim, uh, I just want to tell you, I really enjoy working with you. I know this has been a stressful time. Uh, I appreciate all your support. I appreciate all your hard work. And I look forward to, you know, continuing to work with you. And I'm telling you, those little handwritten notes, John, just make an unbelievable impact on people because they realize that you're going out of your way to do something different and extraordinary for the people around you. They're just incredibly impactful. Yeah, I think it was uh, Simon Sinek who was saying one time that, you know, if you spend the time to do something a little bit extra, even if it's not a lot of time, like writing a note or something like yep. that it makes such a bigger impact than if you just sent the email because yeah, taking that no extra doubt. bit of time, you know, time is that unrenewable resource, you know, yep. you don't give more yep. of that back. So you've got to yep. use that. So. Yeah, it's the greatest gift of all. There's no doubt about it because it is yeah. finite. It is limited. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's can be really, really powerful. 
So. Mm. Yeah. So um, what are some other areas that, that we kind of struggle with when it comes to, or, or how can we be better at self-awareness? You mentioned the 360 review as one way that we can kind of learn, learn about ourselves. What are some other things that leaders can do to kind of figure out where or how other people are perceiving them? Well, I think um, there's, um, and again, I'm, 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 I'm not uh, in the business of, of promoting any particular tool or platform, but there's, mm-hmm. there's a number of really powerful assessment tools that, that are out of the market now that um, help, can help people identify strengths, can help people identify weaknesses, can help people identify gaps, um, you know, their, their, their uh, leadership styles, right? Uh, there's tools that help people understand how are you likely to show up at work normally? And then how are you likely to show up to work when you're stressed? What are your mm-hmm. typical stressor responses? And so there's, there's a number of really powerful assessments and tools that can help people, you know, take a more critical look at, 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 who they are and, and what's important to them and how they show up normally and how they show up under stress. And, and, and I just don't think there's any shortage in being able to use some of these powerful tools to, to take a look at yourself and, 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 and be, um, be critical. I know um, uh, some executives uh, and I know Imelt did it when he was at GE, um, you know, some people actually, um, put a point on their calendar, John, maybe it's Friday afternoon, uh, maybe it's Saturday morning and just look back and say, okay, what did I learn this last week? What were the good things I did? What were the bad things I did? And now looking back on the week, how could I have spent my time more effectively? How could I have done a better job managing my time, managing my work and managing my team? And so you know, I've never had that kind of discipline, but there are a number of people that do and do that and do that routinely. And they, they look, you know, retrospectively to see how they could have done things better and how they can improve going forward. Yeah, it's almost like doing a project retrospective on yourself. It is. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if we if we put something like that in place, how is it that we can you know, adapt and learn from that. Is it, you know, cause it, it, I, I go back to ego. It's one of the, one of my uh, things that I struggle with sometimes is it, I don't want to admit that I'm wrong. You know, I'll find myself sure. doubling down on something sure. And sure. instead of, sure. instead of just taking a step back sure. because sure. it's almost like it's ingrained in me as a kid that, you know, if I, if I admit wrong, I'm showing weakness, but sometimes we've got to show that weakness to show that we're a person yeah, yeah. To, to connect with people. How do we, how do we get past that, that, that piece of it? Well, I think um, c- kind of um, um, complementary to the whole notion of, of self-awareness is also the notion of being vulnerable, right? Um, we, are, we are humans mm-hmm. and we aren't perfect and we do screw up and we do make mistakes and we make mistakes that affect people's lives at work. And, and we just have to understand that that um, you know that's the reality. And um, my first chapter in the book talks about learning from our mistakes, right? And uh, it's one of the most powerful ways we can learn because we do make mistakes, and we're going to make mistakes. As I said, I continue to make mistakes. So just admitting that, being vulnerable, and telling people, "Look, you know, uh, I messed up," and um, I, I understand that and I'm going to learn from that. I think that vulnerability it helps so much with the self-awareness and also authenticity because people know that, you know, we're, 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 we're fallible. We're going to make mistakes. Yeah. 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 I agree hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so w- w- what, what other things do leaders fall short on or mistakes that they make that you cover in your book stifled? Well, I think um, one of the areas, John, is is just being hypocritical, right? Mm. Um, one of the mistakes that that managers make is is come out and they do it at all levels of the organization, saying we're going to do this, right? I, I know one company uh, years ago, they told salespeople that if they wanted to progress in their career and become a sales manager, they had to take another job 
they cut, they had to come to headquarters and do this other job, and then they would be eligible to be made a manager, right? And they decreed that. One of the senior leaders said, if you want to be a sales manager and you're a sales rep, you've got to come into the headquarters, you've got to do this job, and we'll send you back out. And not more than a month after that decree came out, they promoted a, a, a sales rep directly to a manager job because it was a critical need. So uh, hmm. I, what we have to be is more transparent and say, look, this is the general path. This is our preference. It may not always be that way. The trouble we get into is people tend to think things and say things that are very black and white. This is what we're going to do. And one of the things you learn working in large corporate America is, yes, but there are almost always exceptions for all kinds of reasons um, to some of these rules. And just being open about that is, and being transparent, I think is really, really, really important. Yeah, no, I agree hundred percent. I think transparency is one of those things that um, we don't teach enough. We don't talk about it enough. It's just, it's, it's almost assumed that, Oh yeah, you need to be honest and transparent, but yet, we always feel like we need to hold something close to our chest sometimes. And, yep. you know, when you do that, you're, you're, you know, putting that wall up between you and the employees and makes it harder to trust each other. There's no doubt about it. And, and how demotivating, right? I mean, mm. you're standing mm -hmm. up in front of 500 people saying this is the path. And then a month later, you know, the whole thing just blows up and you, you as a leader, I don't think the leaders understand it. They tend to lose credibility, right? The next time they, stand up and say, this is the way it's going to be. Is, is this going to be the way it's going to be, or is it not going to be the way it's going to be? And, and they, I don't think um, people understand the, the impact to the organization and the people when they do things like that. It's, it's really, really, really important. And, and, you know, one of the things that a number of the clients that I work with grapple with is, you know, careers and succession, Right. Most big companies have formal succession plans at some level of the organization. They just do. And if they're public, they have to, at least at the senior level, right, in case something happens. But companies aren't always real, really open about sharing that information with their employees. And I, I just don't personally understand that. You know, if you see potential in me, I'd like to know it. If you don't see potential in me, that's fine too. I'd like to know that too. If I've got gaps that you need me to, you know, build, then I'd like to know that. So I, I just, I, I believe that it's important to be more transparent in a lot of different things that companies do. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you um, yeah. more on that one. Um, so how can people, you know, connect with you and find out more about um, some of the the uh, mentorship things that you offer and uh, pick up a book copy of stifled yeah great great thanks john well you can uh, hit me up on linkedin at uh, james g wetrich i'm very active on linkedin be happy to connect with people there um you can learn a lot more about my book at jimwetrich.com and um my book is available on amazon um and, and other resellers so i'd be happy to help uh and work with anybody that uh you know would would Feel the need. So I appreciate very much the opportunity, John. Oh, awesome. Thanks so much. And I'll link that up in the show notes too at geekleader.com so people can uh, can go that route as well. And uh, thanks again, Jim. My pleasure, John. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed that episode, please uh, leave a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. I'd greatly appreciate that. And also don't forget to check out merch. We have some t-shirts that uh, I've designed that are on at geekleader.com. Um, you can click on the merchandise uh, section there and check that out. And also don't forget about the books from our guests. So if you like this guest and other guests that have written books, please um, go ahead and check that out at geekleader.com. I would greatly appreciate it, and I'm sure they would too.